Okay, let's move over to YouTube because actually Boohoo is pretty big on YouTube. You'll notice lots of people posting Boohoo hauls and these are typically getting tens of thousands of views, sometimes over 100,000 views for their Boohoo hauls but they try on their clothing. So you might expect that Boohoo's own YouTube channel will be really strong, right? Well, in this video, we're going to be analyzing the digital marketing that has made boohoo.com such a powerhouse in fast fashion. We're going to be analyzing their website, their social media, their influencer strategy, their search strategy, paid search, and also talking a little bit more about their business acquisition strategy and the projections for the brand going forward to see how much potential future growth is there with Boohoo and what is the low hanging fruit that they're currently leaving with their digital marketing. And of course, we'll be drawing out any lessons from their marketing, which we can apply to our own business. Because we can't help it, we're also going to be comparing them from time to time to one of their main competitors within fast fashion, ASOS.com. Let's go! Here's a joke for you. What do you get when you mix five pound dresses, a shed load of influencers, and this? A fast fashion empire worth over five billion pounds. Jokes were never my strong point. Okay, so before we get into the digital channels, we're gonna give a bit of context on Boohoo's growth today. So it came from humble beginnings back in 2006, floated on the stock market in 2014, and it's seen dramatic revenue growth from 130 million in 2015 to over 1 billion in 2020. However you slice it, that is one hell of a growth curve. <laughs> now the founders of Boohoo spotted an opportunity, a gap. They could cut out the middleman, produce low price clothing and sell it directly to the consumer. In particular, they're targeting the 16 to 30 audience, predominantly female, who tend to change their wardrobe more often. And what's clear when you study Boohoo is that they're very focused on a price model. They sell very, very low cost clothing, dresses under 10 pounds. And when you go on the site, the main message that you get is pricing discount scarcity. This is very clearly all of their eggs in the discount clothing basket. Now, because they have very close relationships with their suppliers, who are majority UK, UK based. This allows them to react to trends very quickly, which is of course extremely important within fast fashion, otherwise it wouldn't be called fast. So just as we might split test adverts to see which one drives the most traffic to a website, a company like Boohoo can split test products to see which one is most popular and then they can dial up their quantities to be very responsive to customer demand. And of course, lockdown has been a godsend for loads in e-commerce, but particularly brands like Boohoo, who saw their sales increase 45% in the five months to May 2020. Okay, let's take a look at their digital marketing. The first thing that we're gonna analyze is their website. Now we're estimating that the Boohoo site is attracting around 70% of its users on mobile, so it's relatively pointless analyzing it on desktop. Instead, we're gonna have a look and see what it looks like on a phone. Now we're also gonna compare it to the ASOS website because they are fairly comparable. Now fairly common amongst any site where there is a mobile app is you get this little pop-up at the bottom which is trying to get you onto the app, which is fair enough. But if you have already installed the app, this is pretty annoying. I already have the app, so this is pretty annoying. So first impressions when you land on the page, they don't do any attempt to set the scene and really tell you what the site's about. They don't really need to because Boohoo has such strong brand awareness that you don't really need to say, hey, we sell clothing to 16 to 30s, right? It is obvious, you know. Now at the time of recording this, obviously they have a promotion. I don't know if you picked that up. <laughs> We've got this flashing voucher discount thing. We've got a scarcity with the countdown timer. Now it's very clear that they're selling on price and this comes through throughout the site. So what we've got at the top of the page is we've got basically offer categories. These aren't particular product categories, they are just offers. There's no tops, there's no dresses category. This is just offers. They're just trending things that they want to show you. We have to scroll down to see uh, particular product categories and even then these are curated to be tailored to the end of lockdown. Now I haven't been out to brunch for a while but when I did last go out to brunch it didn't necessarily look like this different target audience. We have to scroll down quite far down the page until we do get some product categories namely dresses, tops, curve, and then that's it. Now, I've got a bit of a criticism here, and that is the size of these images. This is something that comes up across the Boohoo site. The size of the images that they use is so massive that there is a huge amount of scrolling required to use the site. 
it gets worse. Obviously, the main way of browsing this site, because there aren't particularly straightforward product categories from the homepage, is going to be through the menu. So we've got this full screen menu, which is absolutely fine, except it's chaos. <laughs> we've got blinking, flashing things. We've got two separate blue things. Now, I'm trying to understand the design language and whether a blue highlighted menu option is something that I should click on. If it is, then why is that banner at the top also blue? Because they probably don't want me to click on that because that's going to take me out of the menu, which I'm now navigating through. So there's an inconsistency here. The next inconsistency is with these categories because we've got conflicting categories. New in, fine, that makes sense. Clothing, well, this is like a top level category. Then we've got active wear, lockdown lifting, which is a promotional category. Tops, that's a product category. Dresses, summer, shoes and accessories, beauty, and then shop by fit, which isn't a category. So we've got a, a mixture of product categories, top level categories, promotions. Now that wouldn't necessarily be an issue, except that it's coming at the expense of product categories. Let's say I wanted to shop trousers, for example. Well, now they're relying on me noticing that there is a clothing top level category in amongst all of these product categories, which I may not do. And the first time I visited the site, I didn't. Anyway, let's go with that and let's click it. So we've now got this complete list of product categories in no apparent order at all. They're not in alphabetical order. So I've got to try and dig through in order to find the thing I need, despite there actually being no logical order to them whatsoever. It's a nightmare. Now, visual chaos seems to be the... <laughs> Now, visual chaos seems to be the theme on the site. We've also got these little images down here, which are too low resolution and way too small on the largest iPhone that money can buy to see what's in the picture. So I doubt anyone's ever made a navigational decision based on those images. So let's just get rid of them. Let's make things a bit simpler. Okay, let's compare this to ASOS. Now, ASOS has a much more ordered and calm approach to navigation on their site. The first thing that we're offered is the choice to shop women or shop men. This makes sense. This is an easy, logical decision that any visitor can make, and it immediately takes them to a section of the site that is relevant for them. Remember that with menus and navigations, we ideally just want to give people a series of very simple choices to make. We don't want to force them to hunt. We don't want them to have to choose through a huge range of different options. So shop women, shop men, that makes sense. I can very easily get to the next stage. But let's check out their menu. Again, we have a similar sort of thing with women and men. However, this menu isn't full screen. The images are larger so I can actually use them to browse. And then they're very clearly just directing people to this clothing category. That clothing category isn't fighting for attention with tops and bottoms and dresses and skirts and loungewear and supersets, you know, all this stuff. It's not fighting with all of those. So if we just give that a click, we then go into a very ordered, in fact, alphabetically ordered list of product categories. It's extremely simple and easy to use and makes this feel like a nightmare. Anyway, let's go through the process of buying some trousers. Let's see if I can find trousers on this site. So we're now onto the product category page. Now this is a key page layout for an e-commerce site like Boohoo because this is where cold product category traffic, like people searching for women's trousers, is gonna come through. It's also the first step where people start to get a feel for the sort of products that are on offer. So it's really important that we make these product category pages extremely browsable, very easy to use, and help people people get to the products that are right for them as quickly as possible. Now, clearly for a site like Boohoo, which has 39 pages of trousers, it's all about helping people find the right products for them. Now, whether you do this through saying refine by or whether you say filter, I would tend to go for something like filter because it's more logical and it's a little bit easy to understand. But nevertheless, we have refined by and it seems to work. We've got all the different options that we would expect, so that is fine. Another criticism I have of this, Again, we're back to the amount of products that are visible on a particular page. So because we've got so much white space between each product listing, we don't even get two full product listings on this massive iPhone because there is so much white space between each product. We don't actually get four full listings per screen. We only really get one group of full listings per screen. Now, again, if we compare this to ASOS, for example, let's say that we go for uh, trousers, we can see that we get the full two listings per screen. And actually, as we scroll down, we start to get more like three because they're using smaller images and there's much less white space between each group of products. Another thing I don't fully understand is why they've taken up space at the top of the page with pagination. This doesn't make any sense for me because I'm not gonna be ready to scroll to the next page until I've seen exactly what's on this page. And the fact that this page is extremely long 
means I'm probably only going to be ready to scroll to the next page when I've reached the bottom. So again, if I were them, I'd lose that and I'd simplify this above the fold section because it's absolutely key. You'll see with some of these product listings, they've actually got different color variations shown on this product category page. That's okay, but it gives, takes up even more space on the page, pushing the next group of listings further down. So if you're gonna be shopping on Boohoo, you're gonna get have to use to scrolling because you're gonna be doing it a lot. Okay, let's look at one of these product listings and see what we've got then. So product photography is good. They're clearly doing it in-house, which is exactly what we would expect. We've got this blinking offer showing again, despite it also being at the top of the page. We're definitely not gonna miss that. One thing that I think is particularly interesting is how we've got the product code here above the fold. So they're actually prioritizing the product code over showing the buy button or the color or the size options further up the page. I don't understand this. For me, the product code is something that is not necessarily relevant to the majority of users. And I suspect it's gonna be unlikely that many Boohoo shoppers are gonna be copying and pasting or searching by product code. So I'd be much more inclined to help get people to the buy the interaction section of this product page more quickly. For example, by reducing the amount of space. We could have the color next to the size chart. We could again reduce the amount of white space and padding between all of these sections. Now the information about each product is really minimal but you know this is fast fashion, this is high number of SKUs, they're not going to be able to write detailed descriptions for every single product however it would definitely help. Um, style notes you know there's really not much there, there's not much in details and care and obviously they've got their Boohoo Premier which is their membership thing which is fantastic. Um, returns info also pretty detailed but actually information about the product is relatively sparse. Other things that they could do which competitors like ASOS do include product videos. Another thing that they could do is shop the look where you can give people a very simple and fast way to buy other items that this model is wearing. So for example, here are the shoes, here are the jumper, just in case someone is looking at that and thinking, oh yeah, do you know what? I'm actually not that keen on the trousers, but I like the jumper or I just wanna buy the whole look. So that would be a good way of increasing average order value relatively easily. There's a user interface tweak that I would also make to this page, and that is that the button to buy actually doesn't say buy. So it's actually not clear where the buy button is until you choose your size. Once you choose your size, the page updates and says add to bag. But until you choose your size, it doesn't say add to bag. Now, I much prefer the ASOS implementation of this. Sorry, Boohoo, it's true. Where you click add to bag and it says, oh, you need to choose your size. This is a much better way of doing it because it's very, very clear for people. The trouble with Boohoo's implementation is that you actually don't know, until you've selected the size, you don't know where the buy button is and it's initially confusing to see what you're actually supposed to do. It's a tiny piece of friction, but with the amount of traffic that this website's getting, it's removing those pieces of friction, which will give a noticeable increase in conversions. So that's the website, plenty of low hanging fruit, but it'll be interesting to see how with acquisitions of more digitally strong brands like Debenhams, um, actually Boohoo is able to enhance their website and put a bit more energy into the user experience stuff. Who knows? Okay, so now let's take a look at Boohoo's social media because if I'm honest, this is where they really excel. On their Facebook page, for example, 3.7 million followers, their engagement rate is awesome. Even on product focused posts, the engagement is strong. Now, one of the main reasons for this will be that they're sharing these engagement type posts like this, which get good engagement, and then they'll share product posts as well. So the product posts will kind of surf a bit of the wave of organic engagement as they've shared these uh, more kind of engagement focused posts. Now, if I'm honest, some of the engagement type posts, I think they could push a little bit further. For example, stuff like this, where the caption is just dreaming. I think they could have pushed this. If you notice the engagement, it's got 4.5K interactions, 476 comments. But if we take a look at something like this, for example, well, this has had 2.5K interactions, but 7.5 comments because they're actually asking a question, tag someone who comes to mind. So I'd be interested to see how they can use this kind of engagement strategy saying, you know, where are you heading after lockdown ends? So let's compare their engagement levels to ASOS's. Now ASOS has a bigger following on Facebook, almost double the number of followers, but the engagement is much, 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 much lower. We're getting like dozens of likes and it's not uncommon for there to be absolutely no comments at all on their posts. 
When they do post something that is slightly meme they get a much better response, but it's still nowhere near what we would expect for this number of followers. And it's a similar story on Instagram. Social Blade shows us that ASOS are getting around about a 0.09% engagement rate on their Instagram posts, whereas Boohoo is enjoying a 0.2%. Now these might not seem like big numbers, but with the size of following that they've got, namely 7 million followers for Boohoo, and 11.4 million for ASOS. Actually, Boohoo's getting reasonably good interaction, whereas ASOS really isn't there. Now, one of the things that will be contributing to this is the fact that ASOS has a much wider audience, whereas Boohoo's audience is much narrower, so that allows them to tailor their content much more to this perfect customer, whereas it's it's much more difficult for ASOS to do that. But even so, let's give credit where it's due. Boohoo, you're doing a great job of your social media engagement. Now we've spoken a little bit about Boohoo's influencers and they very clearly have three different levels of influencers promoting the brand. We have the mega influencers. And when I say mega, I mean Love Island and B-list celebs. So these are typically people with one to 10 million followers. Folks like Jordan Woods, Maura Higgins, they are consistently posting and tagging Boohoo in their posts. This is great if you can get it. These are the most expensive influencers and they tend to have a broadest audience. Now these are obviously great influencers to work with, they have huge followings and they tend to be broadly in the right sort of target audience for a company like Boohoo. Of course they're going to have a bit more of a broader following because they've been on TV so you might notice that the ROI isn't quite as strong as some smaller more targeted influencers but because of their reach the brand awareness that they provide is massive and undeniable. We also have macro influencers so these are typically what we can say 100k to 1 million followers. People like Emma Tamsin, Emily Philpop, who have a smaller following but tend to be more focused and more likely to be Boohoo shoppers. And then we have the micro influencers. So these are like 10K to 100K followers. Now, most of these are probably not being coordinated in an influencer marketing campaign. A lot of these will be posting about Boohoo in order to try and get on their radar and also to try and get on the radar of other brands, which might be more likely to work with people with a smaller following. Okay, let's move over to YouTube because actually Boohoo Boohoo is pretty big on YouTube. You'll notice lots of people posting Boohoo hauls and these are typically getting tens of thousands of views, sometimes over 100,000 views for their Boohoo hauls where they try on their clothing. So you might expect that Boohoo's own YouTube channel will be really strong, right? Well, 11K subs. For a company that gets 2.7 million brand searches per month on Google, that is mental. And by the way, if you're enjoying this video, consider subscribing to the Exposure Ninja YouTube channel. We're trying to beat Boohoo and we're almost there. <laughs> so what's going wrong? Well, when you look at the videos that they're posting, it's fairly clear that there doesn't really seem to be a consistent strategy. Most of the videos that they post these days are campaign videos. These are 15 to 30 second short videos, which they're probably using as ads. Um, there's no attempt to really build a personality with the brand. A year ago, it does look like they were testing a podcast, but they didn't really stick it out long enough to get the results. So so after a little while, it looks like that has been canned. I think this is a real shame. YouTube is hard to build subscribers, but the great thing about it is it increases exponentially once you start getting some traction. So I'd encourage Boohoo to stick with it, to experiment with different angles, bring in some of your influencers and your ambassadors and make them the star of the channel instead. That's gonna mean that they promote it on their channels, which is gonna grow your subscriber base, which is really, really gonna help. I would stick with this. I think it's an important channel and particularly with the recent announcement of YouTube, now detecting products in videos and showing listings against them, I think this is going to be a game that you want to play more. Okay, let's talk about search. Now, search is going to be really important for Boohoo's future, particularly as Mahmoud Kamadi, after buying Debenhams, said, our ambition is to create the UK's largest marketplace. Our acquisition of the Debenhams brand is strategically significant as it represents a huge step which accelerates our ambition to be a leader, not just in fashion e-commerce, but in new categories, including beauty, sport, and homeware. So in order to compete in those categories, we're going to need a very, very strong search strategy because we're going up against huge department stores, huge homeware beauty stores like the Hut Group, which have massive capabilities within search. So first, let's take a look at how Boohoo's popularity in search has evolved over time. Now, clearly we saw a huge increase over the past decade, uh, but things seem to have taken a little bit of a level off. Now, we've seen this with other companies where they start to reach a saturation point, whereas actually everyone who is familiar with Boohoo already knows them, so they're not really gonna increase their volume of branded search, and it's now time to go after product category search. So start targeting broad product terms like 
hoodies or dresses and things like that. So let's have a look at how they're doing on those. Now, what we can see from SEMrush is that actually their estimated search traffic has dropped since the middle of last year. And what seems to be happening is that they're picking up the majority of their traffic for branded search terms, so things around Boohoo. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because there is a huge brand volume for Boohoo, 2.7 million searches per month. So targeting product category searches like dresses, jeans, will be the next level of growth. Let's just have a look at the non-branded terms that they're ranking for. So I'm just gonna add a filter which takes out anything with Boohoo in. And by the way, if you like the look of Semrush, you can get a free trial by going to thankyouninjas.com. The free trial isn't publicly available, it's only for people who watch our videos, so go to thankyouninjas.com and check it out. Okay, so we're looking here at the non-branded search terms for Boohoo, and we can see that yes, they're ranking for some of these product categories. Uh, maternity dresses, ripped jeans, lace bodysuits, sock boots. But the volumes on these terms aren't particularly high, and you'll notice that these aren't the broadest terms overall. So for example, loungewear, we're ranking position four, so still some room to move there. But jeans, dresses, socks, boots, these aren't terms that the site is ranking particularly well for. Dresses, we're on page one in position five. That's a huge term with a lot of search volume. So it'll be those sorts of terms that there is room to improve the targeting on and see how much more ground we can take. Now, if we compare this to ASOS, which has much, much stronger organic traffic volume and seems to be continually increasing, we notice that actually they're ranking really well for key terms like hoodie, jeans, bikini, all these position one, coat, bucket hat, jumpsuit, joggers. These are really, really broad, high traffic phrases. That is why the ASOS site is picking up so much more organic traffic than Boohoo. Now, if we have a look at the link profile to try and work out what could be going on here, we can see that ASOS has significantly more uh, inbound links. So for example, 154 million links rather than 7.6 million across 105,000 websites rather than 32.3 thousand websites. So this is huge. Now, comparing the ranking pages for a term like jeans, we can see that broadly they're pretty similar. Now, I still think that Boohoo's design, I think the user interface, I think could definitely be improved. We've got this hideously complex categorization, subcategory type thing with all these little filter options, which feels very difficult. ASOS obviously using fewer, uh, but still not ideal. Then we've got all these filters as well. ASOS has a bit more category page copy than Boohoo, but I don't think that that's gonna be enough to make the difference. Diagnosing the specific backlink strategies is beyond the scope of this video, because to be honest, there are so many links here that it would take a couple of days to figure out exactly which strategies each are using. But certainly increasing the link profile and maybe doing some more digital PR and getting some content published in higher tier publications might be a way of increasing the authority of these pages. Also running promotions around particular key product categories and driving links to those key category pages would be another way of moving the needle. I can't help wondering if user engagement stats are feeding into this, if people are having a hard time using the menu system, for example, and that perhaps that could potentially be impacting ranking because actually Boohoo has a strong enough brand and great enough engagement that I would have expected expected them to be ranking better than they are. Okay, so let's look at paid search. Now, interestingly, it looks like Boohoo's been experimenting with paid search, particularly in the US, um, over 2019 and 2020 before deciding, evidently, that it's not working out for them and almost completely turning it off. In the UK, however, it looks like they haven't been running any paid ads at all, which feels a little odd. However, Google Shopping has been more of a focus for them. Although again, this is something that it looks like they've almost completely turned off. Now, I would suggest that some of the targeting maybe hasn't been quite on point here. For example, Running ads against lingerie babes, that is a completely different search to someone who's searching for lingerie. So optimizing a shopping campaign like this is all gonna be about digging through the search query reports and pounding the negative keywords in there as fast as these searches are coming out. These are high volume keywords with a lot of potential wasted. So it's all about identifying which products are profitable, slamming those, but also working with the margins. One of the things that we have to keep in mind with Boohoo is because the product prices are so low, the margins aren't really there to be paying 20, 30 pounds cost per acquisition for a woman's coat search. So that's really not gonna make sense unless they're really confident in their lifetime value and they know that some of these purchases are gonna be gateway purchases to bring in a Boohoo shopper for the first time. I can understand the reluctance to run paid search and I would suggest that potentially this might be more of a targeting thing than the channel just not working out for them. So there we have it, a real mixed bag between some things they're doing fantastically well. For example, that social media engagement 
on Facebook and Instagram, huge. And other areas where it looks like there is some room for improvement, for example, around the website, particularly navigation. And of course, within search, particularly organic, given that their profit margins aren't gonna sustain massive CPAs that they might get from very competitive, broad product type search in Google Shopping and text ads. It will be interesting to see how their purchases of brands like Debenhams, Oasis and Warehouse, Dorothy Perkins, Wallace and Burton allow them to beef up their e-commerce offering. Obviously, this will bring them loads of customer data. It'll bring them dev and optimization teams, presumably from those businesses as well. And it'll be really interesting to see the e-commerce platform that they build to run all of these sites on. I think that particularly around the e-commerce platform, there are loads of lessons to be learned from what the Hut Group has done. Not necessarily just using their Ingenuity platform, but the layout and conversion rate optimization of those sites feels a lot more considered than what's going on here. And of course, if you're interested in that, we have a video all about the Hut Group's digital marketing just up there. So what can you take from this and apply to your own digital marketing? It can often feel intimidating going up against huge brands like Boohoo, but as we've seen today, they're not getting everything right and actually very few businesses are. We always look at the big companies in our markets and say, oh, they're just geniuses, they're smashing everything out of the park. But often there is an opportunity, they're leaving some weaknesses because digital marketing is so broad and requires such a huge range of different types of expertise to get perfectly right. So that always means that gaps are being left and those gaps leave them open to competition from competitors. Remember, this is essentially the game that they've been playing with the old guard of low-cost fashion retailers. They came in and exploited e-commerce weaknesses in the old brands that are now replaced. And it's up to companies like Boohoo to maintain their position by constantly filling in the gaps that they're leaving and working on optimizing every element of their digital marketing strategy. It will be so interesting to see how new social channels opening up changes the game for them. Do they start targeting a younger audience? Will we see the changes around paid ads and cookies benefit brands that have more first party data and will their acquisitions of companies like Debenhams help them to compete there? Obviously Debenhams owning a huge amount of first party data. Another thing that will be really interesting to watch is how the groundswell of feeling about fast fashion changes and whether allegations about factory conditions and things like this will lead to influencer boycotts. It feels like we haven't really decided as a society what we think of these things yet. So it'll be important for Boohoo to stay right at the top of those conversations and make sure that they are completely aligned with what their target audience is thinking about the price versus working conditions balance there. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't enjoyed it, then I hope that it's been moderately useful. If you'd like us to analyze your website, then you can request a free website and marketing review from Exposure Ninja. Don't worry, this won't be public like this one. Uh, all you need to do is go to ExposureNinja.com forward slash review. Tell us a little bit about your business. One of our consultants will then analyze your website and your digital marketing. They will record a video specifically for you and they'll send it over to you by email, usually within two to three working days. This will analyze how your site's doing, how your competitors are doing and the opportunities for improvement and growth. And this video will analyze how you're doing, how the website is doing and your opportunities for growth across search, social and paid channels. If we think that we can help you with your digital marketing, because this is what we do here at Exposure Ninja, then of course we will let you know. One final thing to remember, Boohoo was once at the level you're at now. You've got this. See you next time.